Good evening and welcome to uh, tonight's event entitled A Linguistic Approach to Linguistic Canons. My name is Barrett Anderson and I'm the Vice President for Professional Development for UVA's Federalist Society chapter. The Federalist Society of Law and Public Policy Studies is a group of conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. It is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Tonight, we are joined by the Honorable Thomas R. Lee of the Utah Supreme Court and esteemed scholar, Professor Lawrence Sowell. Associate Chief Justice Thomas Lee was appointed to the Utah Supreme Court in 2010. He graduated with high honors from the University of Chicago Law School and then clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson on the Fourth Circuit of the United States Court of Appeals and Justice Clarence Thomas on the United States Supreme Court. Prior to his appointment to the bench, Justice Lee was a shareholder at the Salt Lake law firm Parr Brown, served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Division of the Department of Justice, and was a full-time professor at the law school at Brigham Young University, where he continues to serve as a distinguished lecturer. He has also taught classes at Harvard Law School and the University of Chicago Law School. Lawrence Solom is an internationally recognized legal theorist who works on constitutional theory, procedure, and the philosophy of law. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School and he clerked for Judge William Norris on the Ninth Circuit. Professor Solom teaches civil procedure and constitutional law here at UVA Law. His series of articles on constitutional originalism have shaped contemporary thinking about the debate between originalism and constitutional theory. Uh, thank you both for joining us tonight. We appreciate your time. First, we'll hear from Justice Lee, followed by Professor Solom uh, with some commentary. Uh, before, we get want, before we get started, I want to remind the audience to submit their questions via the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen, and we'll return to those questions at the conclusion of both panelists' remarks to facilitate an audience Q&A. And with that, we'd like to turn the time over to Justice Lee. Thank you, Barrett. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. Hopefully that's uh, working. I don't know if somebody can give me a, Barrett, or if you're able to give me a thumbs up and let me know whether that's working. There we go. We're good. Great. Such an honor to be here and to be um, invited. Uh, Barrett, thank you for that very nice introduction. And um, to, to Larry, to Professor Solom, what a, I hope you all realize what a treasure he is and what a, amazing addition to your faculty. Uh, his work really has um, influenced my thinking and um, it, uh, it's really, I, I think his, his mark in the field of law and language and originalism and interpretation is, I, I don't think can be overstated. Yeah, I'm, I'm honored to have him here and to, to count him as a, a friend and a colleague. So I, I wanna, I want to introduce to you sort of first off some thoughts about um, the role for corpus linguistic analysis generally in interpretation, sort of what's drawn me to the, to the utility of, of linguistic tools to interpret the language of law. And, um, and then I want to sort of bridge into some work that I've started to do in a piece that I hope to publish later this year on how some of the theories and tools of linguistics might inform our thinking on uh, some of the linguistic canons of interpretation. The starting point, I think, is to, to understand why we credit ordinary meaning, or as Professor Solom's work has put it, ordinary communicative content. So Professor Solom's work has helpfully distinguished between the communicative content and the legal content of the language of law. The first point to make, I think, is to underscore the idea that nearly everybody starts with an inquiry into communicative content and or underscore some of the reasons why. Um, I'm not going to read the slide to you, but uh, so, sort of the, so some of these principles are rule of law sorts of principles. They are rule of law principles that are um, rooted in uh, the basic idea. A basic idea is that principles for discerning communicative content give us more objectivity, more determinacy, more predictability than other approaches to interpretation. 
Um, these are principles that uh, ha have sort of attracted me uh, to textualism and to originalism and um, principles that I want to pick up on because it, in, in a way the a theme of what I want to present to you today is um, sort of a question as to whether we are delivering on, on these promises, whether we are living up to the idea that the tools we are using to discern communicative content are sufficiently determinate and objective and, and constraining. Um, it's important to sort of talk about what we mean by communicative content. Here, here are a couple of ways to conceptualize this idea. Frankly, part of the problem is we haven't ever really conceptualized it particularly well or, or very concretely or or clearly, uh, but Holmes kind of framed it in terms of how would a normal speaker, speaker of English um, use words in a given context. Uh, and, then, and then a quote from a Holmes opinion in the McBoyle case, which is a sort of real world, no vehicles in the park case about whether an airplane is a vehicle, sort of the, the idea of a rule of conduct in the language of law laid down in words that evoke a picture in the common mind. I'll, I'll refer back to these principles later they, they may overlap to some degree. They, they may uh, be a little bit different um, to some degree. So I, I, I've suggested in talks that I've given and opinions and, and, and articles that I've written um, that, that sort of part of my reaction, part of my thinking on why we need more in the way of linguistic analysis of the language of law that, that I think we're kind of falling short on some of the promises of textualism. Um, I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit, um, and I may make reference to, to some of these cases. At, at least one or two of these may be familiar to you if you've had a legislation course. Um, the, the scope of these cases and kind of the initial work in the law and corpus linguistic space has to do with what you might think of as lexical ambiguity, which is to say ambiguity with respect to the meaning of the, the sort of dictionary meaning of a, of a term in a in a statute or in the constitution. So in the Taniguchi case, the question was, what does that term interpreter mean in a federal statute that calls for uh, the recovery of costs? And the, is an interpreter limited to an oral face-to-face -face, um, translator or does it extend to someone who interprets or translates written documents? The Costello case is a, a Seventh Circuit case in which Judge Posner wrote a majority opinion uh, opining on the question of the, the meaning of this verb harbor in a, in a federal statute making it a crime to harbor an illegal, illegal alien. The question in Costello, also a lexical ambiguity question, does harbor, is it, is it a broadly encompass providing any sort of shelter or is it limited to the idea of harboring someone, uh, you know, meaning tr trying to um, protect them or secrete them uh, from, from being discovered? The Muscarello case presents a similar sort of problem. What does it mean to carry a firearm in this statute that provides a mandatory minimum sentence? Um, does carries a firearm, is it uh, limited to packing it on your person, that kind of carry, or does it sweep more broadly to encompass transporting it um, in, in a vehicle? These are the kinds of problems that I've proposed to use corpus linguistic tools to resolve. I'll talk about what, what corpus linguistics is in just a second. In terms of some of the points that I've tried to make about where I feel like we're falling short on the promises of textualism, part of the problem goes to how we're theorizing ordinary meaning. Part of the problem goes to how we're operationalizing it or, or measuring it. With respect to theory, let me, let me take you to the Muscarello case. That's the carries a firearm case um, that I just mentioned. Part of what's problematic, part of, part of the shortcoming in terms of what I call under delivering on the promises of textualism is we, we talk a good game about um, seeking to discern communicative content or ordinary meaning, uh, but, but we're not really very good at pinning ourselves down to what, what we're really looking for. So in the Muscarello case, Justice Ginsburg, sorry, Justice Breyer um, authors a majority opinion concluding that the ordinary meaning of carries um, sweeps more broadly and encompasses carries um, in a vehicle. And, and in, in stating that, he um, seems to sort of float back and forth between the idea that, well, that's ordinary because it's a, it's a fairly common 
sense, or at least a, a way that we sometimes use that verb. And then uh, another point is, in his opinion, he seems to be suggesting, well, it's ordinary because it is the more common sense of the use of that verb in that linguistic setting. Um, this is sort of this problem that if, if, if we're going to purport to have an idea that discerning communicative content is this objective, determinate, kind of limiting inquiry, we need to be more precise about what it is that we're, that we're looking for. And, and to the extent what we're looking for is this sort of empirical question about how um, a, a normal speaker of English or an ordinary person you know, might use a given word or a given phrase in a given linguistic setting, um, we, we ought to be a little more precise about what we mean by that. Uh, linguistic prototype is, is possibly another way to sort of think about what's going on here. This, this might bring to bear sort of this um, idea of a picture in the common mind, um, a, a, a picture or a prototype of a piece of furniture might be a chair or a table, perhaps not an ottoman. Maybe sometimes when we talk about ordinary meaning, at least sometimes what we might have in mind is the idea of a linguistic prototype. I can come back to that maybe a bit later um, as well. Uh, the other problem, set of problems that, I've, uh, that, that we've tried to identify has to do with, all right, let's say we can try to be more precise about what it is that we're trying to measure to theorize ordinary meaning. How do we go about measuring it? What sort of evidence do we have um, of, of, the, of the way that a natural speaker of English would use the language or the picture in the common mind? Um, dictionaries, it turns out, get overused and I, I, I think used for purposes for which th th they aren't built. To go back to the Muscarello example, Justice Breyer's majority opinion, um, claims to support his conclusion that carries a firearm, the, the ordinary sense of carries a firearm is uh, conveying it in a vehicle by citing the Oxford English Dictionary and noting that if you look through the ranking of senses, you find that carries in a vehicle appears higher in the list of, of sense ranking in the Oxford English Dictionary. There, there's a pretty big problem with thinking about it in that way. And that is that uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, if you look in the front matter, indicates that uh, the way that it ranks its senses is, is uh, chronologically in the order in which, um, according to the evidence available to the lexicographers who put that dictionary together, the order in which those senses entered the English language. So somewhere in the 13th century, somebody who was speaking something that looks a little bit like the English that we speak today, started using the verb carries to describe somebody conveying something in a vehicle. Uh, once you understand that that's how a lot of dictionaries are built, um, I think you can see that that's not a, good, a very good way to discern how we use language um, today. We also sometimes, judges also sometimes use principles of etymology. Justice Breyer does that as well. He says, hey, I know what the ordinary meaning of carries is also because I can trace back our English verb into Latin or, or French. And uh, the, the root in Latin or French is, is car and traces to vehicle and, and therefore uh, ordinary meaning. Also not a good way to discern how our language is used uh, today. Of course, our languages evolve in, 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 in ways that don't have anything to do with um, etymology or the, the root of our words as we use them uh, today. I'm going to bridge to have a conversation about the canons in a minute, but canons are also sometimes cited as good tools to discern ordinary meaning. Uh, human intuition, I think, is a, certainly a good starting point, but, but um, part of the premise of the Corpus Linguistics Project is the idea that, look, if we're asking something of an empirical question about how language is ordinarily used, we ought to check our intuition, and we shouldn't use tools um, to try to answer those questions that aren't really built to answer them. So corpus linguistics, what is it? Linguistics, of course, is just the study of language. And uh, a corpus is a body of language. And the idea of corpus linguistics is that you can discern, you can acquire and, and analyze evidence of language usage by looking at samples of natural real world language in large bodies of text. You could think of a, a Google Books search or a Google News search or even a Westlaw search of a body of cases as that kind of um, corpus, linguistics, corpus linguistic analysis.
Uh, a corpus linguist would put together a balanced corpus that would um, include, uh, you know, perhaps um, both fiction and nonfiction, a range of um, even transcripts of, of spoken uh, word to try to give us some sort of balanced sample that we can use to try to understand the ordinary meaning of language. Um, I'm not going to go through all the detail that's on this slide, but this uh, the, the tools of corpus linguistics have um, started are, are, are being used more and more as time goes by 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 the courts. Um, I published an opinion in 2011 um, proposing to use corpus linguistic tools to interpret the language of something called the Parental Kidnapping Protection Act. Um, to, uh, to, to very little applause amongst my colleagues. It was an opinion that um, uh, drew a lot of criticism, in fact, from my colleagues in the Baby EZ case, criticism that I can come back to maybe uh, toward the end. Um, one of the points of this slide is to note that, at, at least on my court, this is sort of the spike the football slide. In Richards v. Cox, um, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, a unanimous majority of my court um, came around and uh, used corpus linguistic analysis to interpret the language of the Utah Constitution in the Richard v. Cox, Richards v. Cox case. And I've got some other sites here of, of other courts um, that have used these, uh, these tools. Okay, let me, let me sort of bridge to make some observations about linguistic canons. And I wanna talk about two canons in particular and, and explain what I, what I hope and what I think linguistic theory and linguistic tools can do to help us make the linguistic canon inquiry uh, better. I wanna sort of start just by explaining how the canons are often theorized, how they're justified, and, and then indicate where I think we're falling short here. This is sort of a, a parallel to the point about dictionaries can get us started, but they can't really answer a lot of the problems that we have to answer in interpretation, I think there's a similar problem with respect to the canons. So the basic um, sort of positive case for the canons is that the, these are expressions of shared conventions of language usage, that the canons tell us how strings of words and statutes will be read, what presumptions will be entertained as, as to a statute's scope and meaning. To, to borrow from the Scalia and Garner reading law treatise, these are principles of language usage that are rooted in common sense, shared conventions of how we use language. And Scalia and Garner say, context will tell us when uh, the presumption of expressio unius or anti-surplusage um, applies and when the, when the presumption is rebutted. There's also normative arguments that are made in favor of the canons. The canons being sort of the idea of a system of established rules of construction. This is sort of a law of interpretation principle that um, Will Bode and Steve Sachs and others have advanced that um, these are whether or not they actually represent language usage, they are rules embedded in our law of interpretation around which drafters of statutes should, should, um, uh, should, should draft in the shadow, I guess, of, of, of those rules. This is sort of the idea of a feedback loop that statutes should follow the canons in, in reading law. Scalia and Garner say, for example, um, even if you don't always expect legislators necessarily to avoid surplusage, well, they should do so. They should hire eagle eyed editors to avoid surplusage. So I wanna have time to get into the details of, of all the examples that I wanna talk about. I, I may just hit a couple of these, but um, I want to use, uh, tr propose to use linguistic theory and, and a little bit of corpus linguistic analysis to tackle some problems of uh, interpretation with respect to either the anti surplusage canon or the expressio unius canon. So, really quickly, just to state what those canons are about, I, I, probably you know, but the Expressio unius idea is the idea that the expression of one set of terms or conditions is the exclusion of the other. Um, and the anti-surplusage principle is a presumption that language is used, um, uh, is presumed to have independent meaning, not presumed to, to be surplusage. W with respect to both of these canons, nobody thinks of them as hard and fast rules. Everybody understands that they are presumptions subject to rebuttal. So some examples that have come up in the, in the literature, the Moskal case is an important um, 
anti-surplusage case. This is a case involving a federal statute that makes it a federal crime to transport in interstate commerce any falsely made, forged, altered, or counterfeited securities. The question in the Moscow case has to do with whether um, it's, it's a washed title case. So people are rolling back odometers and sending um, the, the rolled back odometer reading to the Commonwealth of Virginia and, and, and getting washed titles in response. And the, so the titles themselves are genuine. And the question is, does that count as a falsely made, forged, altered, or counterfeited security? You see, you have a, a majority opinion from Justice Marshall concluding that uh, falsely made includes um, documents that are themselves genuine, but that have false information in them and relying on the anti-surplusage canon in support of that view. There's a Scalia dissent, which I can talk more about in a minute, um, reaching the opposite conclusion and saying, well, this is just acceptable surplusage. Um, an important, I think an interesting um, hypothetical that's dealt with in uh, Bill Eskridge's casebook on expressio unius is this idea of think about a, a, an injunction that a mother makes to the children in a car, no hitting, kicking, or biting. This is sort of a classic expressio unius question. Is that an exemplary list or is it an exclusionary list? Does it, in, does it extend to pinching? More about that in a second. Here's one last example. Uh, there's a New Hampshire statute. This is a case that's addressed in the Reading Law book. It says municipalities are not liable for damages arising, arising from hazards on public highways, bridges, or sidewalks when caused solely by snow, ice, or other inclement, inclement weather. Uh, in the New Hampshire case that's discussed in Reading Law, the question, the, the um, injury that arises, arises as a result of an injury in a parking lot. And this is an expressive unius case, a question about, well, if the, if the legislature said public highways, bridges, or sidewalks, is that exemplary or exclusionary? And these are all problems on which the, the canons can be employed. And, and the big question with respect to the canons, a big question with respect to the canons goes back to my first slide, do they provide determinacy? Do they provide objectivity? There's the famous criticism that Carl Llewellyn made, um, which, which is um, no, they don't. They, all they really are are just a sort of cover for judges doing whatever they want. And there are opposing canons on almost every point. So, so you, can, you can put the um, anti-surplusage canons opposite in terms of a counter canon. You can sort of call it the uh, abundance of caution canon. Uh, Abundante Catella canon, and and that that sort of suggests, or that criticism is um, sort of a criticism that it really doesn't, that the canon really doesn't get you um, anywhere. Let, let me see if I can summarize. Let's see what's going on in the in the Moscow case just really quickly, and use that as a bridge to some of what I want to say about how I think linguistic theory and linguistic tools can help us in in this field. So the basic disagreement between the Marshall majority in Moscow and the Scalia dissent has to do with this canon. How much credit to give to the idea that this is a list of things in a statute that includes counterfeited um, and, and uh, as well as this term falsely made. Um, Justice Marshall's majority said, look, if, if Congress didn't mean to give um, independent meaning to falsely made, it would have just sort of left off with forged and counterfeited, no reason to add falsely made. Falsely made must mean something independent. It, it shouldn't be surplusage. Scalia's response is, well, no, I think falsely made is just a legal term of art. This is a statutory list that also already has a bunch of surplusage in it. And he cites some evidence that in his view supports the idea that this is acceptable surplusage. This is sort of the big question, I think, for these canons. Um, when do we accept rebuttal of the presumption? And, and, and how, do we, um, how do we sort of conceptualize the canons and, and identify a linguistic basis for their application? So the, the criticism that I have, I, I, I think to some degree I agree with the um, with, with, with the Llewellyn criticism and to some degree, I would say, look, if the best we can do, which is mostly what Scalia and Garner do in their treatise is to say, 
common sense will tell us whether a statutory expression is exclusionary or exemplary. I think we haven't really come up with much in the way of a determinate rule or the expression of a, of a standard that tells us something about shared language convention. And that, that isn't a system of, of rules. It isn't a system that disciplines or constrains the process of interpretation. Having said all that, um, or, or having acknowledged that point of criticism, our thought, and this is a, a piece that I'm working on with uh, Jesse Egbert and uh, Zach Lutz, our thought is that having, having acknowledged that point of criticism, we think linguistic theory and linguistic tools can help us connect our canons with linguistic norms of actual language usage and give judges tools to accurately decide whether to follow a given canon or fall back on a counter canon. Our, our basic idea, let me try to develop this idea in a couple of minutes and, and then maybe just show you one application with respect to one or two of the problems um, that I've mentioned. Our basic idea is rooted in um, Gricean maxims. So Paul Grice is a, a linguist who identified some principles of language usage. One of his principles of, of language usage is this idea of a cooperative principle that participants in language interaction can be expected to make a, con a conversational contribution at the stage at which it occurs and by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which the two are engaged and that contributions will be as informative as is required for the current purpose of the exchange. And, and the basic idea that we wanna convey is that language use is situational. So if you wanna ask yourself something about is a given sort of piece of legal language an acceptable piece of surplusage, something that you can sort of understand why it would have been included, even though it kind of seems like it's um, a, a little bit surplus and, and a little bit redundant of terms that are already there. You have to understand something about the language community or the register that's at work. So the idea of language register is the idea of, of context, of uh, the mode of communication, the relations among the participants in a given language uh, community, the setting, the circumstances in which language is produced, the communicative purpose. Um, and, and, and our basic idea is that maybe we can understand the domain for anti-surplusage and, and expressio unius based on an understanding of what we refer to as the statutory language register that we, we, we ought to sort of understand that this is a particular mode of communication. It's written communication. It's intentionally difficult to produce. It's, it's hard also to revise or to adapt sort of on purpose and by design under the constitution. It's producers are constitutionally limited. It's consumers also have limited opportunity for interaction. And it's mostly one shot communication that is either mandatory or prohibitory and carries significant sanctions. Um, with it. And, and, and we suggest that in light of those features of the statutory language register, we think that language produced in this, in this domain ought to be as, or, or the producers of it can, can be expected to understand that it ought to be as comprehensive and precise as possible. Given the high stakes of the language communication, given that it is generally one-shot communication, not the kind of iterative interactive conversation that would have happen in the context of, of, of conversation. Language theory also tells us to be suspicious of what you might think of as true synonymy. And, and another observation that we make is that precision and comprehensiveness in this field may be enhanced by incorporating formulaic chunks of language. Language meaning is, is understood to be stored not always at the word level, but at the phrase level. Um, let me offer some general implications for the anti-surplusage canon and, and then say something about how it maps onto the Moscow case and then, and then try to wrap this up. So um, we suggest that there are two reasons why a given contribution may be necessary. This, this goes back to the Grice idea that um, we, we understand language contributions. Um, we, we expect generally that people don't say things that are unnecessary, but whether it's necessary depends on the context. And, and, and we suggest that a given contribution may be necessary, even though seemingly surplusage, uh, 
if it's aimed at enhancing precision and comprehensiveness of the law, if it's aimed at incorporating a, or if it's aimed at incorporating a formulaic chunk of the language of law. And then we make a converse point. We say, if a given contribution fulfills neither of these purposes, it should be given independent meaning. So this is sort of the building block of an idea that would say, here are some reasons to give really strong um, credit to the anti-surplusage canon in some circumstances. Um, if you can't identify one of these sort of reasons for including language that might seem to be surplusage, then it's really important to credit the independent meaning of the language of the law. Otherwise, you're going to override the structural limit on who has the power to make uh, law. I I'm going to leave the um, I'm going to leave the expressio unius point aside for just a second and, and see if we have time to come back to it. So here are some sort of quick thoughts on, on how this theory uh, might map on to the Moscow case and some preliminary corpus linguistic analysis that we did to try to analyze the debate between Justice Marshall in majority and Justice Scalia in the dissent in the Moscow case. So here's the operative language from the statute, falsely made, forged, altered, or counterfeited. What we propose to do with corpus linguistic analysis is to, to look at a naturally occurring body of language. We, we, the body of language we're looking at is actually a body of case law. We think of this, we, we, we at least take Justice Scalia's um, suggestion that these are words borrowed from uh, the language of the law. And the first inquiry that we try to look at is whether the language of the statute seems to be formulaic. This borrows from the idea that um, language in this register can be understood to be incorporating chunks of language that has meaning um, at, a, at a phrasal level rather than an individual word level. Um, and, and then we also propose to look at that body of case law, that corpus of case law, to try to dig into at a, at a more systematic level, to dig into the question that Justice Scalia seems to be identifying in his dissenting opinion in the Moscow case, which is, does falsely made just restate the same thing that's already conveyed by forged or counterfeited, or does it seem to be saying something in, independent? Um, I won't dwell on the details of this slide, and I don't know well, you know, how, how legible it is, but our, our preliminary corpus analysis suggests that, in fact, there is some formulaicity going on that um, with respect to uh, the, the language of the statute in the Moscow case, if you look at a body of case law and, and, and you look at um, randomly selected sentences taken out of a body of case law, when the law uses those phrases, it tends to use them um, together and it tends to use them generally in the same order in which they appear in the statute. We suggest that that is some indication at least that this is a formulaic chunk of language and that that might be an independent reason not to worry so much about the anti-surplusage problem. So the inferences we draw in our, our, our corpus analysis is underway, but the inferences we draw are that the, the full phrase is more often used in the order in which the phrase appears in the statute. The, the phrase falsely made appears relatively infrequently, generally in the body of cases but in a large number of those cases, it appears in some sort of multinomial. In other words, um, a, a list of things that includes other elements of the statutory list. And we say that this provides some support for the conclusion that falsely made is being used formulaically. What about the similarity question? This, this work is also underway, but, but um, we, we think that it may be really useful to try to look at actual evidence of how the terms falsely made, counterfeited, forged, and altered are used in this body of, of, of uh, case law, in this um, register of, of legal language that we think at least arguably was incorporated um, into this statute. The debate, let me, let me give you a little bit of background and then say a little bit of something on this slide and try to, try to wrap this up. The debate between the Marshall majority and the Scalia dissent is, is kind of unsatisfying in this respect because Justice uh, Marshall is sort of saying, hey, look, the only reason why falsely made would have been included is if it were meant to 
convey something separate and distinct from forged or counterfeited. And then he looks up falsely in a dictionary and made in a dictionary and says, look, you can, you can easily talk about a title having been falsely made if it has false information in it. Scalia's response, and, and so it's, it's judicial intuition, it's Justice Marshall's intuition, it's intuition based on dictionary definitions of isolated words falsely and made instead of sort of phrasal understanding. You can get better phrasal meaning out of a corpus than you can from a dictionary. But Scalia's response, I think, is also, also unsatisfying. Justice Scalia's response um, is to say uh, a couple of things. Uh, you know, first of all, he, he sort of says, hey, take my word for it, um, falsely made. Uh, the false, he says, logically must be um, modifying the verb made. And he says, as a, as a sort of grammatical logic, if you're going to talk about something being falsely made, the falsely must be in the making. And so that's his position in dissent, that if you don't have, if you have a genuine document, you don't have an altered or a forged document, you don't have something that is falsely made. Um, we think that that's not the right way to think about how language works. We think that a better way to think about how language works is to, is to look at um, evidence of, of how that phrase is actually used. And then Scalia's next point is to say, oh, and by the way, take my word for it, falsely made is used in this way in the legal genre, in the legal register. And then he cites some isolated examples. And this is the last point I'll make, um, and, and, and then I'll wrap this up. We think that this is an important um, point for corpus linguistic tools, uh, to, to uh, an important contribution for corpus linguistic tools. This is sort of the idea that um, if what you're trying to discern is ordinary language usage, you ought to be interested in evidence of ordinary language usage in a naturally occurring um, body of language usage, not one individual judge's sort of sense of how language is, is often used. So I, I'm gonna stop there and uh, look forward to, to uh, Professor Solom's response and your questions. Uh, great, well, uh, uh, thank you, Barrett, and uh, thank you, Tom. I always learned so much from Tom. So, um, uh, Justice, Lee, uh, uh, Justice Lee. <laughs> so, uh, here we go. So, um, what's going on here, right? You're, we're, we're experiencing something uh, that may be new to many people in the audience, and that is that we're bringing together the disciplines of linguistics linguistic theory and the philosophy of language uh, with legal thinking about the interpretation of legal texts. Um, and uh, of course we are. Uh, textualism has become very important. Originalism has become very important. And uh, uh, textualists are trying to figure out what the statute actually means, what the constitutional provision actually means and the idea that we would ignore the um, well-developed systematic um, tools that have been developed in linguistics uh, and the philosophy of language in that enterprise, it just doesn't make any sense. It's like trying to do antitrust law with no economics, uh, uh, you know, based on the assumption that, that, that um, the goal of antitrust law is something like consumer welfare. So, um, uh, but in the law schools, uh, th this is an innovation, right? So certainly when I went to law school, uh, there was no discussion in any class about what tools you would use to try to figure out what a statute actually means. Uh, and, you know, in fact, in general, we didn't even, this is Harvard Law School of the early 1980s, we didn't even talk about the statutes or the text of the Constitution. I, I had constitutional law pro with Larry Tribe, great uh, legal scholar, but we never ever read the text of a constitutional provision. We always just started with Supreme Court cases and then debated about what they meant. 
So the turn to linguistics is a natural result of textualism and originalism, right? So Tom, Tom, Tom's presentation was just fantastic. I, I, you're very fortunate to have been here. And um, if, you, if, if you have an opportunity to do so, I would, I would strongly recommend applying for a clerkship with Justice Lee uh, because uh, that's going to be quite an experience and, uh, and an important part of your intellectual development. Okay, so how does communication work? And so there's a model in linguistics and the philosophy of language that's been very influential. It's developed by this philosopher, Paul Grice, who uh, uh, Justice Lee has referred to. And uh, uh, one of Grice's very important ideas that we need to understand as lawyers is the idea of speaker's meaning. So speaker's meaning is the idea that in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, the way conversation works is this, that the speaker says something and what the speaker is trying to do is to get the listener, the person in the audience, to recognize the speaker's communicative intention, what they were trying to get across. Of course, we all grasp this um, intuitively because we have these conversations every day, right? And um, uh, in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, we don't have to rely on ordinary meaning. In a one-on-one -on -one conversation, uh, frequently people speak in idiosyncratic ways. So if, you know, if you have a, a partner or a spouse, there's probably all kinds of words and phrases that over the course of the, the weeks or months or years uh, have acquired idiosyncratic meanings between the two of you. You understand exactly what your spouse is trying to say or your partner is trying to say to you, right? Uh, because you have this deep background knowledge. Legal communication is different, right? Legal communication involves a complex multi-stage process. So a contract is drafted. How does that happen, right? Some associate goes to a bank of models right, and selects the one that's the most appropriate and then adapts clauses to the current situation, right, um, and, uh, or they use a model contract, right, lots, there are lots of these out there created by various industry groups. Well, that's not like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And in fact, of course, we know that what happens sometimes is that the person who actually drafts the contract didn't know what these clauses meant, right? Because they were just using a model. Or we have legislation, right? So same thing happens with legislation. Stock phrases get repeated from one statute to another. And it's a multi-stage process. The, the statute may start out with a lobbyist who writes a statute and then hands it over to a sympathetic legislature uh, who hands it over to the staff that they work with the language proposed by the lobbyist or the public interest group, whoever it is, and then it's modified in markup. It goes from a committee to the floor to the other body of the legislature. It, a committee in that body, further changes are made. Then it goes on to the courts, to the public, to the regulated industry, depending on who the audience for the statute is. And legal communication is not fully cooperative. This is super important. In a conversation, ordinarily, we're cooperating to convey meaning. But in legal communication, you're instantly worried about, well, one thing you're worried about is the lawyers will get a hold of this language and try to twist it and turn it, right, to their advantage. So that means that you have to communicate in a different way, right? Another difference, very important. In an 
ordinary conversation, we're just speakers of English, we may have our own little idiolects. We may use some words in non-standard ways, but if you're having a conversation with a, with a stranger, you have to use language in very standard ways. Lawyers all the time use very technical language, right? That um, uh, involves the linguistic subcommunity of lawyers. So um, all of that has to be taken into account. And when we do take it into account, we want to distinguish between two things. One thing is the semantics, what the words mean or phrases mean. Justice Lee really emphasized this idea that it's not always, meaning is not always compositional. It's not always that you just add the words together. Sometimes a whole phrase has a distinct meaning that's not reducible to the meaning of the individual words. So that has to be taken into account. So we need to figure out the semantics and the syntax, right? The way that uh, subjects and verbs and adverbs and adjectives all relate to each other in complex structures and punctuation. Lawyers really big up punctuation, right? Commas versus periods versus semicolons. All of those things are on the semantic side. They produce the literal meaning of the statute or contract or constitutional provision, but there's also pragmatics, that's context, right? So what does context do? One thing context does is it disambiguates, right? So the word uh, bank appears in a statute. If it's an environmental statute dealing with water pollution, it's probably the bank of a river. If it's a financial institution regulation statute, it's probably bank in the financial institution sense. We disambiguate this way all the time without even thinking about it because we're able to recognize the relevant sense of a word that has many senses from context. But there's another thing that goes on. Now, it's called pragmatic enrichment. I just want to make it clear, this is not Posnerian pragmatics. This is a specialized use of the word pragmatics in linguistics and the philosophy of language. So one way in which context enriches meaning is that you don't have to say everything. You can say some things, and then the reader fills in other things. Right, so espresso unius involves this phenomena sometimes. We give a list of things. Now, because we're engaged in legal communication, if we're good legal communicators and we intend the list to be open, we ought to say that explicitly. But because people do this all the time, they give a list and they assume their reader is going to fill in the blank. That is, they're going to add at the end of the list and other things that are relevantly like the things on this list, because we do that all the time in ordinary communication, sometimes drafters of statutes just assume that without thinking through that really, since this is a statute, maybe we ought to say it explicitly, because some lawyer will argue it's a closed list when we thought it was obvious it was an open list. So corpus linguistics now comes in, right? And it's so useful, right? It is so useful because it provides primary evidence of semantics, of word meaning and phrasal meaning, right? It's much richer than dictionaries are. And dictionaries are just secondary evidence. They're not primary evidence. Corpus linguistics enables us to get to primary evidence of semantics. And it's systematic and rigorous, right? Whereas what judges do, and Justice Lee just described this with the Justice, Justice Marshall and Justice Scalia, is they rely on their own linguistic intuitions, right? Which are not necessarily accurate and may be biased because the judge may unconsciously be stretching towards a result, right? And Corpus linguistics gives us a way of testing that in a systematic and rigorous way. So one more thing now about the canons, right? So Justice Lee emphasized this. I just wanna say that the canons ought to be viewed 
not as legal rules, but as rules of thumb. They are empirical generalizations. That's one of the reasons corpus linguistics is so useful because it allows us to systematically examine these empirical generalizations. Now, Grice had a theory, right, that is highly relevant to many of the linguistic canons, right? He, he, he talked about the maxims of conversation. So the maxim of quantity, for example, was this idea that you, you try to say just what you need to say and no more, right? Because it's a conversation, you don't want to be going on and on. Of course, we lawyers, we love to go on. But nor, in a normal conversation, you don't want to be going on and on. You want to communicate efficiently. So the maximum of quantity says you say only what you need to say. Well, this is the same idea as expressed in the canon that says we ought to assume that legal communication is not redundant. Except, of course, this is only a rule of thumb. So lots of times we are redundant, right? And so uh, the, the work that uh, uh, Justice Lee has done with his co-authors shows you how this can work. One reason you're redundant is because you're worried that someone will try to twist the language. And so you try to say it two or three different ways in order to make sure that you get your point across when you know that, the, that some people are going to be trying to resist your communication. They're not trying to get what you said. They're trying to convince other people to not get what you said. So redundancy serves that function. And right, redundancy results from the fact that we have complex multi-stage communication where people borrow words and phrases from prior communications, they combine those borrowings, they borrow a clause from here and a clause from there, they borrow a phrase from here and a phrase from there, they put them all together. Of course, we see this all the time in legal documents, so they say the same thing two ways or three ways or four ways. And that's normal for legal communication. Why? Because legal communication involves this special process, this complex multi-stage process. Um, so um, just really in trying to say that what you've heard here today was super important. You're really, you know, like I feel thrilled I'm here to hear this work uh, at this early stage. And, um, uh, and then now I'm gonna make a pitch if you're interested in this kind of approach, I'm teaching constitutional originalism next semester. We're going to do corpus linguistics and a lot of other stuff too, a lot of more conventional historical research, but this will be a course in which you would really learn how to do this um, and not just sort of the theory and the normative debates, all that will be in the course too, but that in some sense, the most important thing about the course is really trying to provide you with the methods to do good textualism. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Thank you both so much. Um, that was incredibly helpful. We have several questions that we'd like to get to. Um, hopefully we have enough time to get through them all. Uh, Justice Lee, uh, there's a quick question concerning what are judges supposed to do um, when the evidence from corpus linguistics points equally to two different conclusions or it's ambiguous? What is the proper approach uh, when maybe a, corp a corpus linguistics analysis doesn't come to, you know, a not a definitive conclusion, but point in one direction? Yeah, this is a really important question. Um, and, and we could probably talk about it for a while. Let me try to give a quick answer. And um, yeah, Professor Solomon, if you want to chime in as well, I'm, I, I always learn so much from you. Um, so if you have any thoughts. So. You know, what, one, one thing to keep in mind is corpus linguistics is not a theory of interpretation. It is a tool that gives us evidence that may sometimes um, refine the inquiry into communicative content. By the way, it is also a tool that may sometimes lead us to um, what you might think of as closure rules or um, other grounds for resolving ambiguity or indeterminacy with respect to the threshold inquiry into communicative content. So the fact that we may sometimes run into 
evidence that is indeterminate um, isn't a flaw in the tool. Um, in fact, it is another contribution of the tool in that it, it, it may allow us to quantify and make more transparent the need to turn to other tools. Think of the rule of lenity here. You know, let, let's say that when you do your corpus analysis of the question in the Muscarello case, you decide that you don't have enough determinacy in the evidence that you get from the corpus about carry on your person versus carry in a vehicle. Um, at least then we can sort of show our math. We, we can show our math in a, in, in a transparent way that's replicable instead of Justices Breyer and, and Ginsburg sort of saying, take my word for it. And then maybe we can point to it and say, maybe there's enough indeterminacy or ambiguity here to turn to something like the, the rule of lenity. Perfect. Uh, Professor Solomon, did you uh, jump no, in on let, that? Let's get more questions in. Perfect. So kind of playing on that same, that same idea of uh, corpus linguistics as, as a tool, um, how would you respond to criticisms that corpus linguistics is too scientific? Um, it seems like some people are uncomfortable with this tool because they believe a judge's instincts are a reliable tool uh, for determining what language means. Um, and that tools like corpus linguistics might overly uh, make this overly formalistic. This is also a really important question. Um, and, and, and I wanna agree with pretty much the entire premise of the question and, and, and say that the criticisms that I've made of dictionaries and canons and you know judicial intuition, you know whatever, can, all those same criticisms can come back against what we're trying to make of the evidence that we can get from these tools if we're not careful about it, if we don't develop, um, I, I think, sort of settled, accepted best practices. If we don't develop a law and linguistic community, which is part of what we're trying to do, try, trying to sort of engage a dialogue with linguists um, and and law professors and judges and lawyers, you know, whereby we sort of come together and understand what you can and can't get out of a corpus. Um, so we shouldn't pretend that um, this is easy. We shouldn't pretend that all you need to do is just sort of throw some garbage into a computer and, and, and you're gonna get a magic answer out. If you put garbage in, you're gonna get garbage out. And we need to be really careful and, and not claim to find more determinacy from corpus evidence um, than, it is, than is otherwise there. Um, but but let, let me make one other point in risk, because this is such an important question. Let me make one other point. I, I've suggested that it seems to me that we are in a fork in a road that has three paths. And I, I think that um, the three paths that are available to us are, number one, we could conclude that um, this inquiry into communicative content is too hard. And that the linguistic theory and tools have sort of highlighted problems that people have been skeptical about for a long time, therefore throw it all away and just let judges do what Judge Posner seems to want to do. or. Uh, you know, since Posner's already been mentioned a couple of times today. Judges just ought to do whatever they think is best from case to case. I don't think that's where most careful thinking people are. Go all the way back to that first slide I had up there. I think there are too many good reasons to credit ordinary communicative content. So I, I would not go down that path. Um, another possibility would be to say, oh, this corpus stuff is hard, it's weird, it's unusual, it's difficult to know exactly where it's gonna lead us. Um, therefore, maybe the second path is, let's just keep using dictionaries and etymology and linguistic intuition and, and the imperfect tools that we have today. I don't see why we would do that just because we haven't perfected the third path. And to me, the third path is the only viable one and, and it's, not, it's not fully mapped out. It's not an easy path. It's one that's gonna require a lot more careful thinking, but I, I, I think it's the one we need to pursue. I totally agree with what Professor Solomon said. It's, it's really weird that we have this, so much of what we judges do is to try to disambiguate language, but we don't have a field called law and linguistics. That, that's a crying shame and, and we need to fix that. And, and I think we will, I think that's, that's ongoing. So those are some things. And I, I, I did agree with everything that Justice Lee just said, and I would add, um, uh, 
I think that there's two sources of resistance here. Um, one source of resistance is, well, this stuff is new. They didn't teach me this at the University of Virginia, or they didn't teach me this at the University of Chicago. They didn't teach me this, in my case, at Harvard Law School. So it must not be important. And part of this is a, um, a defensiveness, right? All it, it, the, the, the introduction of corpus linguistics suggests that actually people who are great lawyers and judges and law professors don't have all the tools they need to do their job well. And when someone tells you that the first time, your first reaction is to say, no, I've got all the tools I need, right? You know, and so that's a defensiveness. And then the second thing, which I think is equally important is that there are a lot of legal realists out there. A lot of judges are legal realists. And so they don't really want tools that will help us figure out the language in a very rigorous way where there's actually proof because they like doing business in a world where if you've got any plausible textual hook plus a little bit of purposivism in your in your theory you can get to the result you want to get to and so they find corpus linguistics threatening because it threatens to expose what they're doing, which is amending statutes with bad interpretations. And, and, and obviously, if, you're, if, that's, if that's the way you conduct your business, anything that threatens to expose that, you're going to be defensive about it, even if that's not the way you think about it consciously. Right? You don't have to be in bad faith to have this kind of a reaction. You can just sort of say, well, but this isn't how I do business. And this way, like, this is going to get all this other stuff in here that just doesn't seem right. That's not the way I interpret statutes. So both of those reactions are out there. Perfect. Um, you, you've both mentioned statutes multiple times. Um, we have a question here. Uh, corpus linguists, linguistics can inform judges um, is there any way that it can reasonably and realistically be used to teach legislators how to draft better statutes? Uh, do you foresee that happening in the future? Is that a tool that legislators can use as they draft uh, statutes more carefully, hopefully? I mean, as a, as a practical matter, I'm not, I'm not super sanguine about the idea that legislative drafters are going to do the heavy lifting involved in corpus analysis as they, as they draft statutes. I think it's too fast paced and too many other pressures on the time. But, but I, I do think there may be some angle on this that might work. What, one way to think about the, the, the linguistic analysis of linguistic canons project is that, that, that it aims to make more discernible and determinate the canons and to identify um, with greater precision what the rule of thumb is. Right, so, so it's not that useful to say that sometimes the expression of, one, of the one is the exclusion of the other. It's not that useful to say that sometimes the, um, uh, we, we presume independent meaning. What would be useful is to be more precise about it and to say, hey, we, we've found evidence of language usage and these are the circumstances in which the expression of the one is strongly understood to be the exclusion of the other. And, that kind of corpus work, I, I can't imagine a world, a future in which we, we also even develop sort of organic canons from the ground up using not just language theory, but language tools. And, and then we have drafting handbooks. I don't think the drafters are going to do their own corpus analysis, but if you give them drafting handbooks that sort of say, these are the conventions and you state the rules of thumb with some degree of precision, I think you could get that feedback loop that Scalia and Garner seem to talk about. The, the vague idea that they're gonna hire eagle-eyed editors, that's not gonna happen. But if we could give them a, a, a rubric and a framework, it, it might. I, I just add to that, that there might be a couple of pathways to get corpus linguistics into the drafting process. One is that in a lot of drafting, it's very high stakes, right? The people who are actually doing the drafting um, uh, are, 
uh, you know, they're not inside Congress or inside the state legislature, they're outside. And they're trying to achieve very specific goals that are very important. That might be that they're very important because they'll impact the profitability of an industry, or it might be very important because this is a public interest group and they have goals that are central to their mission. So if they if if their lawyers learned in law school to do corpus linguistic analysis, at some point they're going to realize that, hey, maybe we ought to re- run this phraseology you know, through uh, the corpus tools and just see what would happen when this stuff actually gets before the court. And, you know, there's a feedback loop here. That is, the more courts are using corpus techniques, the more incentive there is sort of to, to um, uh, uh, check your statute against the corpus, uh, against corpus analysis to make sure that it won't, that you won't, you're not using accidentally phraseology that's going to produce a result that is not in your interest. And then just a second thing is, I, some state legislatures have institutional drafting operations that take sort of the raw statute that's produced in the committee and then they run it through a whole set of editorial conventions. And in those states, I can imagine that those institutional adjuncts to the drafting process might be good. You might be able to get them interested in corpus techniques because they're kind of good government people. They want the statutes to work. And so, and if, if they can be convinced corpus analysis will help them in their job of making statutes work, they might be willing to do that. We wanted to finish up with one last question. Uh, Justice Lee, you mentioned uh, you were spiking the football with your uh, baby EZ case to Richard versus Cox and how your colleagues on the court have kind of come around to, to this viewpoint. And we had a question, if you could elaborate a little further on, you know, how you saw your colleagues' reactions and evolution when it came to um, corpus linguistics, because a lot of us are interested in, you know, maybe how does this how does the judiciary evolve and kind of start to incorporate this more? Yeah, so let me see if I can give a short answer to this question in light of the time. Um, there's sort of three principal cases in, in this string that sort of tells the story of corpus linguistics on our court. One is the easy case in which the uh, I had a lone separate opinion and all four of my colleagues not, not only sort of wouldn't didn't want to sign on to, to the utility of these tools, but they they unanimously in a in a majority opinion said that what I was doing was improper and even unethical, that it somehow beyond the judicial capacity to do this kind of independent linguistic analysis. Um, the, the the second case in the string is is a case called State versus Canton. This was an opinion that I wrote a couple of years after EZ, and it was a unanimous majority opinion in which I did what I sometimes refer to as corpus light analysis. It was a a Google news search and presenting evidence of a Google news search informing the understanding of a a term in a tolling statute in the criminal code of, of Utah. So the Utah criminal code says that a statute of limitations is told for a period of time in which a person is out of the state. In the Canton case, the question was, what does it mean to be out of the state? Does that mean being physically beyond the boundaries of the state of Utah? Or does it mean being beyond the reach of the, of the legal authority of the state of Utah? And that's a kind of a classic lexical ambiguity problem with sort of phrasal meaning. Um, the state of Utah could either mean the physical boundaries or it could mean the legal authority and out of could either mean sort of spatial or, or just um, a, a different kind of sort of legal relationship between the parties. And so it was a problem that you couldn't get an answer to in a dictionary for a range of reasons. And I um, suggested as much in my majority opinion. And then I dropped a footnote at the end saying, oh, and by the way, our analysis of the statute somewhat informed by the structure of the statute is also supported by, if, if you do a search for um, out of the state in Google News, uh, this, the, this is the evidence that you that you find. So the the interesting thing about the Canton case, this is part of my answer to the question, is that that's a unanimous majority opinion. No, nobody 
made a peep. Nobody had a squawk after having said corpus analysis is wrong, wrong, wrong. And, you know, for reasons Professor Solo referred to earlier, people are uncomfortable with new things. Part of, I think, what was going on in Canton, I think some of what I had written was starting to be applied in other cases in other, by other courts and in, in law reviews. And, and a bigger part of it, I think, was my colleagues can understand what a Google News search is, and it's, it's, it's less uh, new and seems less sort of out there than using you know, something called the corpus of contemporary American English. Um, and the last you know, data point is the Richard B. Richards v. Cox opinion. Part of the answer there, I think, is big credit to my colleagues, you, you know, being open-minded and being willing to sort of listen to my response and to my pushback, which I, I don't think there's any way to say that it's unethical for me to try to get additional evidence of the meaning of the law any more than it's unethical for me to read the Federalist Papers or do some sort of originalist analysis to, to try to understand the meaning of the Constitution. That, that is always my job to get evidence of the meaning of the language of the law. So I think they, they saw that. And I, I think part of it is um, lawyers are by nature, lawyers and judges are by nature conservative. And we, we are more willing to go along when we have some company. And there was some company by then. And so I, I think that's the other thing that happened by the time we handed down the Richards case. Perfect. Well, we're getting uh, getting close to the end of the hour. We'd like to thank our panelists, uh, especially Justice Lee, for joining us tonight, for taking the time um, after such a crazy week, especially. Um, and with that, we would like to uh, end our next event, I believe, will be November 14th, but we'll be sending out an email about that. So thank you to our panelists. And with that, we will conclude. Thank you so much.